Good morning. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us here this morning on our online worship service. And as we prepare our hearts for service this morning, I'd ask that you bow with me in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the promise that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you to be among us today. And we celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice, Lord. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love, Lord. We ask all of this in the glorious name of our Savior. Jesus Christ. Let us all say Amen. The Lord's our rock, in Him we had a shelter in the time. Secure whatever He'll be tied, secure whatever He'll be tied. He's a shelter in the time. Don't you know my Jesus is a rock, in a weary land. Oh Lord, a weary land. Oh Lord, a weary Oh, my Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time A shade by day, defense by night, a shade by day, defense by night. He's a shelter in the time of No fears along the poles of fire. He's along the poles of fire. He's a shelter in the time of Jesus is a rock in a weary land, oh Lord, a weary land, oh, we, oh my Jesus is a rock in a weary land, oh rock in the oh he's a shelter in the time, he's thou my helper ever near me, Shelter in the time of storm. Don't you know my Jesus, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. land. Oh Lord, a weary land. Oh, we, oh my Jesus, Jesus is a rock. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. land. He's a shelter He's in the time of storm.
see the church family. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father God in heaven, you are so worthy to be praised. You are a God, Lord, that never, ever fails to, to fulfill your promises. And such, Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for another day that you have given us, given us an opportunity to come before your throne and give you the praise and worship that you are so worthy of. Heavenly Father, we just pray for strengthening of our faith. We pray, Heavenly Father, that at this time, as we prepare for your message, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive whatever it is in it that you would have us to receive. We pray for the speaker of the hour. May his words be illuminating. May his words be edifying to our souls. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are lost at a time right now, Heavenly Father, with so much going on. There's so much confusion. Uh, we are dealing with the pandemic, Heavenly Father. It seems overwhelming at times. But we do know and we do trust that you are in control. And as such, Heavenly Father, help us right now to be singly minded. May our focus be exclusively on you and your son, Jesus. And again, Lord, we just pray that you will fill us with your spirit here and now. Heavenly Father, we ask for forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will strengthen us in those areas that we are weak in. And Heavenly Father, above all things, we just pray, Lord, that we would be just as merciful and, grac and, and graceful to those around us as you have been unto us. We love you and we honor you. And it's in Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen. We now prepare our hearts to commemorate the work of our Savior at Calvary. We ask that you give your attention to the unleavened bread. With this bread, we are reminded of the sinless sacrifice of our Savior. His sacrifice established the fellowship of believers. And by partaking in this unleavened bread, we are reminded to keep our relationships with each other pure. The Apostle Paul says, let us keep the feast, not with the leaven of wickedness and malice, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let us give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you for this reminder that our relationships with each other is to be without wickedness and malice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may eat the bread. We now ask you to prepare to partake of the cup. With this cup, we focus on the blood sacrifice that enables us to have fellowship with Christ. When we partake, we declare that we have been forgiven of our sins and have been brought into union with him and his purpose for our lives. Let us give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you for this reminder of blood sacrifice that brings us into fellowship with your son. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Amen. You may now partake of the cup. The that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary the blood that gives me strength
that is through our tithes and offering. Our giving is just an expression of how God has blessed us throughout this week, how he has blessed us financially on our jobs. And at this time, we are giving back to him, which already belongs to him, a tenth of the first fruit of what he has blessed us with. Let us bow and give thanks for the tithe. Father God, we are so, so overjoyed and so elated, oh Father, that you have blessed us in so many ways. We thank you right now, dear Father, for the increase and that we continue to, to give you thanks and glory for all that you've given us, dear Father. We thank you now. We thank you always. Amen. And then there is the, the offering, and the offering is, is not a commandment. It is just an expression of how good God has been to us above and beyond anything we could possibly expect. And that's through our offering. We give this way through different ministries that we may see that may need help or assistance. But it is the overflow of God's graciousness to us. Let us bow and give thanks for the offering. Father God, we thank you for the overflow, the unexpected blessing that you have placed upon us, dear Father. We just give in such a way that you will be pleased and, and that you will be honored, dear Father. We just ask you to continue to bless us, to keep us in your care. We ask these things and all things in Christ's name. Amen. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God oh we we'll see how great how great is our God the splendor of a king robed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice Dr. Dwayne Winrow. Can't say enough about Dr. Winrow and the Reseda congregation. Uh, it's uh, uh, just a delight uh, to be with you, and I'm looking forward, as I shared on last week, uh, to having some more time uh, with each of you. Uh, so what we've decided to do over the last, uh, last week and this week is to actually do a two-part series, uh, and the theme is Making Sense 
out of my nonsense, making sense out of my nonsense. And this week's lesson is entitled, After You Mess Up, Get Up. After You Mess Up, Get Up. But just in terms of review, last week we looked at the story of Adam and Eve, and we talked about Genesis chapter 3 and all that's entailed with the interaction between Adam and Eve, the serpent, and God. And we concluded, uh, as we worked through that sermonic presentation, that when we are looking at mistakes in our lives, like we see in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve and partaking of the fruit, that we want to pay close attention and think about our own lives and how we too can really make it difficult, how we can really create some, uh, some sometimes tragic situations. And we looked at the three ohms. Number one, as we are understanding what we've done, the kind of mistake we've made, we want to own it. We want to own our situation. Uh, there's no value in not owning what we've done. So if we're going to look at it uh, in a healthy way, it begins with our first taking on responsibility, taking responsibility, rather, for what we've done. Number two, uh, not only must we own our situation, but we must own our philosophy own our thinking, how are we thinking about what we've done? And we looked at some things uh, relative to that. For example, as we're understanding the full gamut of what we've done, we want to assess and to evaluate, and we want to do some meditating. If you didn't get an opportunity uh, to tune in and listen to that, I certainly want to encourage you to do so. And then finally, we looked at owning our theology. So owning our situation, owning our philosophy, and owning our theology. And in this sense, generally speaking, theology has to do with the study of and interacting with this doctrine of God. But in this specific point, I wanted you to think about two things. Number one, as I think about my mess, how do I look at God through and in what I've done? And I've talked about two extremes, how uh, on one hand, we have those who look at God like the great Easter Bunny or the great pumpkin Charlie Brown or Santa Claus. And then, and then we have, at the other extreme, those of us who say, well, God is all about judgment and fire and brimstone and damning everyone to hell. And then I encourage us to think about God as a compassionate parent. So as we are thinking about our own kids and some of the things that they've done, we don't want either extreme. We want to look at God as a compassionate parent. And then I close looking at Galatians 3, 25 through 27. And there we talk about how does God see us? How does God view us? There is great temptation to want to be negative on ourselves or to be negative with others. And I want to encourage us to, you know, to really not tune in to how people are perceiving what's happening in your life. Let's be attuned to how God looks at us. And I talked about the New Testament word justification, and it's a judicial term, and it describes the way that a judge looks at a defendant. So when God looks upon us as the alien sinner who's obeyed the gospel, what God actually sees is the redeeming, sanctifying, blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses and is cleansing us on a repetitive basis. So when we ask the question, how does God view us? God views us in that way. So that was last week's sermon. So now this week, we're back again, and we're going to really put our focus on now. Okay, I've gotten through it. I understand. I'm thinking about it properly. My, my, my theology is healthy. Okay, now we want to get to action. And we're going to use as our uh, proof text, uh, as our text rather tonight, sec as our text, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 through 16. 2 Samuel chapter 12, turn there with me, uh, verses 13 through 16, and I'm going to be there in just a moment. You know, everybody likes a good story, a good comeback story. Uh, if you think about the movie Rocky, if you 
think about the movie Hoosiers, if you can look at some of the uh, things that we've watched over the years, everybody loves a good story or even a good comeback story. And if you were to type into Google the top business comeback story of all time, you would read about Steve Jobs and Apple computing. So just kind of step back with me in time. Apple comes on the scene. Steve Jobs is a, a really young uh, co-CEO or CEO, and Apple pretty much skyrockets. Eventually, as we cross into the 80s, Apple begins to suffer and suffer tremendously, so much so that Apple's board separates from Steve Jobs. Now, that's the company he founded, but now he was looked upon as being toxic for the way that Apple wanted to be viewed moving forward. So a number of years elapsed, Apple had some success, but as we uh, now move into the 2000s, it's fairly obvious again that Apple is in trouble again. And what was happening is they were just having some trouble trying to redefine themselves in tech culture. So what did the board decide to do? This same board, decided to bring Steve Jobs back on. And at the time, he had a new uh, startup called Next. And so they bought the company. Steve then became the new CEO of Apple. And Steve did three things. And these three things brought Apple back from almost bankruptcy. Number one, number one, Steve Jobs, he settled his feud or Apple's feud with Microsoft and Bill Gates. They've been competitors uh, as long as anybody could remember. Uh, Jobs reached out to Bill Gates. Bill Gates gave a cash infusion of about $150 million. And what Steve Jobs then allowed was for Microsoft to attach their software to Apple's computers and devices. It was a tremendous uh, business move for Apple. The second thing that Steve Jobs did is that he went into, in, into the, uh, the lab at Apple and he came up with some new things. They redesigned computing. Many of us have MacBooks, MacBook Pros, MacBook Airs. Uh, we have what's called, or what was called at the time, an iPod, which was an electronic device where you could play music, download it, and then you could take it with you if you're working out or jogging. And then he had the iPhone. So between computing, the iPod, and the iPhone, and the iPhone, excuse me, Apple just totally revolutionized itself and to where even today they are now uh, the leading company in the tech world. So that's a fantastic comeback story. Uh, they were at the brink of bankruptcy, and now they're leading. Uh, Steve Jobs, of course, as you know, passed on. Uh, others have stepped in and taken on the role, and they're doing uh, doing well. But this comeback story that I'm going to talk to you about today is much better than Steve Jobs. And it involves uh, a Old Testament character that we are very familiar with by the name of King David. King David. And again, as we shared with you, I'm going to be in 2 Samuel 12 in just a moment, but let me kind of set up 2 Samuel uh, 12 with 2 Samuel chapter 11. So here we are. David King David is over Israel. Uh, his kingdom is at war with another kingdom. And if you know anything about David, they were often, often fighting. So here they are fighting. A lot of the men are out fighting. He's out on uh, walking or on the rooftop, and he looks and sees a beautiful woman bathing. Her name is Bathsheba. He inquires as to who she is, She's married to Uriah the Hittite. And remember that, that that's, that's a very critical fact. Uriah was not an Israelite. Uriah was a Hittite. Uh, he worshiped amongst the pagan countries that interacted with the nation of Israel. So that, that was her husband. So uh, even knowing that, he still wanted Bathsheba. He sent for her had relations with her, and wouldn't you know, she became pregnant. 
How is that going to be explained? Uriah is not here. He's trying to pretty much keep things on the DL. So what does he decide to do? Does David complain? No. David, King David concocts a scheme. And the scheme is to send for Uriah. So he tells a messenger to go tell Joab to tell Uriah to come. Uriah comes and he wants Uriah to have relations with his wife, but Uriah is not that kind of man. While his friends, perhaps some of his family members, are fighting, he's not going to enjoy time with his wife. So even though David sends for him, David allows time for him to have this, this intimate moment with his wife, he actually sleeps outdoors. And he wants the city to know that he's an honorable man and that he's not going to enjoy his wife, and I'm paraphrasing, while his countrymen are out fighting. So the next day or two, King David understands this. Now he takes this charade further. What does he do? He sends Uriah back. He sends a messenger to Joab, and he tells Joab to put Uriah in the front, in the heat of battle. So he does that. And wouldn't you know that Uriah ends up being murdered by his king. Then we get to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and the scene opens where the prophet Nathan tells David a story. And for time's sake, we won't go into the story, but here's what David concludes. The jig is up, and now he understands not only does Nathan know, but God knows about the mess that he's created. So in responding to the prophet, now we're in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 through 16. And here's what the word of God says. Then David confessed to Nathan, I sinned against God. Now I want you to notice two things. Number one, David is taking ownership of what he's done. That's a great thing. Of course, we're not excited about what he's done, but we're happy that he's owning his behavior. That's always a good thing. The second thing I want you to notice is that he says, I've sinned against God. So as he's trying to understand what he's done, not only has he taken a man's wife, not only has he murdered that man, not only has he impregnated that lady, uh, all of that's happened, but that's really happened against God. So he says, I sinned against God. Verse 14, Nathan pronounced yes, but that's not the last word. God forgives your sin. Thank God for that. You won't die for it. But because of your blasphemous behavior, the son born to you will die. After Nathan went home, God afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he came down sick. David prayed desperately to God for the little boy. He fasted, wouldn't go out, and slept on the floor. And of course, you'll know that the young boy died. So it's a, it's a sad, sad commentary that King David understanding his position, understanding his prestige, would commit such a heinous crime, a heinous act. But isn't that much like us today? As we think about our lives and the things that we've done, can we not see that in our lives, in its totality, we too have made some major mistakes. We've made some major missteps. Now, I want uh, to, to look at what David did. Now, uh, of, of course, I'm, 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 I'm really talking about us, but I, but I want to approach our sermon today asking three questions. And the first question is, why did David commit the sin? Why did David commit the sin? Now, of course, David's not with us. We, we, we don't have a written record where David explains in detail what happened. But here's what we can say. That in many situations where we make these kinds of mistakes, what's happening is that we, we're ex ex 
expressing what's called uh, our being self-absorbed. And when we're self-absorbed, we are preoccupied with our own feelings, with our own interests, with our own situations. In, in other words, I'm not thinking about others. I'm thinking about myself. Doesn't that sound like David? I'm not thinking about how, what I might do, how that might affect my loved one. I'm thinking about pleasing myself. David was self-absorbed. David was only interested in his own needs, his own desires, his own wants, and his own pleasures. The same can be said for us today when we find ourselves in this type of situation that we're not really aware, but we're self-absorbed. Now, what is normative for the believer is not to be self-absorbed, but to be self-aware. And when we are self-aware, we are talking about conscious knowledge of one's own character, feelings, motives, and desires. In other words, I'm conscientious about what's going on in my heart, in my life. I'm weighing the pros and the cons. I'm understanding the risks of my decision and what that decision might cost me. When we're self-absorbed, we're not thinking about that. When we're self-aware, we are. Now here's the thought. If we are self-aware, and if we are healthy, I talked about that's normative, then that's going to then steer us towards staying away from any type of decision they may have that may have a negative outcome. David certainly took advantage of the situation. He took advantage of his kingship. He is the man. If David wants a woman, if David wants to do this, no one is going to stand in his way. And he certainly bears the brunt of that kind of decision and its aftermath. So what about you today? What about your life, your situations, and the things that you have found yourselves in? It's very easy to be self-absorbed. It's, it's, it's very easy to only be concerned about your own needs and your own desires. And I want to encourage you today to, to pray for a spirit of self-awareness, that you can be more conscious, that we all can be more conscious about the decisions and the potential outcomes of those decisions. If David had been more aware, Uriah the Hittite, who actually showed more honor, who showed more integrity than a person who knew God, Uriah the Hittite would still be alive today. So number one, why did David commit the sin? Number two, I want to examine how the prophet Nathan and David defined David's actions. I read into your hearing that David said that he sinned against God. So as David thinks about what he's done, he's conscientious about things happening at multiple levels. So at one level, he's committing this sin and it's affecting Bathsheba, it affected Uriah, it affected that entire family. That's at one level. But at, and it, at a totally different level, David said, I've committed this trans, trans, transgression against God. And this is a very common way of articulating the way that people interact with other groups of people. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 through 40. Jesus says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Enter you who are blessed by my Father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation, and here's why. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep 
are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in person and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling, excuse me, the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone who's overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. So Jesus, David, and Nathan helps us understand the depth of our mess. Not only are we transgressing against the families that we're involved in, but we're actually transgressing against God. Now think about that. When we make a decision that's contrary to the will and word of God, though it involves others, ultimately we are combating God. We are transgressing God. David, as he looks at the depths of what he's done, he writes Psalm 51 as a way to articulate where he is in his life. One of the things that I've done this week for uh, our presentation is that I've actually inserted just above the video today an MP3 of a song that I wrote many years ago called Have Mercy on Me. And it was actually written at a difficult time uh, in my life. So if you get an opportunity to uh, check it out, I'd love to hear what you think about it. But like David, like uh, David rather in Psalm 51, David actually writes and David articulates the pain and the frustration. Now let me just kind of step back a little bit and tell you this, that when you see a person writing like David writes, you're really aware of the depth of what he's feeling. He's very emotional and he's very upset about what's happened. And, 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 and you can read along with him and you can feel his anguish. So as we're thinking about identifying with what we've done, this, I think, is a wonderful model. That's why I talked about on last week. We can't just look at things quickly and, and, and feel that now, yes, we understand. No, it takes time to really feel the depth of our depravity and the depth of how we've hurt other people. David says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, listen to what he says, against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, David says, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the upward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. He continues, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Can't you hear David pleading? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David is emotional. David is very grieved about what's happened. And his song bears that out. And then finally, finally here, after David has gotten all of this out of his system, he's considered what he's done, he's responded to it holistically. The next thing David has to do is to get up, dust himself off, and do his best to put this chapter of his life behind him and to try to rebuild trust, regret, regain the love and affection of those that he's affected. I want to challenge and encourage you today for those of us who find ourselves in this predicament. 
You can only sit around and be sad for so long. Eventually, you have to reach a point to where, yes, I've come to grips with what I've done. I responded to it fully. Now I'm ready to put some things in place where this can become a distant memory of my past. Friends, we have to get up. And if we call the road today, there are many men and women who find themselves, much like David, trying to continue on after a difficult moment. We call Jonah, and Jonah would come, and Jonah would talk about how he uh, made a, a treacherous decision. God was rather obvious in what he wanted him to do. Excuse me. And rather than obey God, Jonah decided to go the opposite direction. He's not going to go to Nineveh. He's going to go to Joppa. And what did God do? God raised up a mighty fish who took Jonah in for three days and three nights and then spew him out on dry land. Then and only then was Jonah ready to go to Nineveh. And here's what God did. Now notice, this came after all this mess. Jonah preached the saving message of God, and the whole city, the whole city repented. The whole city, excuse me, repented. This is after Jonah disobeyed God. Moses, rather than speak to a rock, Moses struck a rock. God was specific in what he wanted Moses to do. Rather than obey God, Moses disobeyed God. What did it cost Moses? It cost Moses his ability to go into the promised land. Now, was God gracious to him? Yes. Did God allow him to at least see the promised land? Yes. So though Moses messed up, he still led the people of God all the way up to the land of Canaan. If we had time, we talk about Jacob and how Jacob tricked his brother out of his birthright and how Jacob then had to flee to Haran to try to find a wife and, and to put all that had happened in his past. God took a crooked man, a deceiver, a trickster, and God used that man, changed his name to Israel, and, and his 12 sons would later become the 12 patriarchs of the tribe of Israel. What are you telling me? I'm telling you today that though we can sometimes find ourselves in a situation where we made some mistakes, don't fret. God can still use men and women who made mistakes. God can use you, and God can use me. So, friends, where do you stand today? Don't allow what you've done to be something that just totally shuts you down. Give yourself some room to know yes, I've made a mistake. Yes, I know I can do better. And then, friends, I want you to do better. If you want to respond to today's Savior's invitation, I encourage you to do four things. Number one, admit your need. Be willing to receive faith. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. After you've heard God's word, after in faith you've received the saving message of the gospel, accept Jesus as your only Savior. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you are renouncing every other leadership, temptation, or influence, or carnal desire that you have. You're turning your back on the world, and you're opening your life now to Jesus and his path. Not only must we act in faith. Not only must we repent, but we must acknowledge him as Lord, and that's our confession of faith. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. After you've confessed Jesus as being the Christ, then this morning we'll baptize you as an act of obedience. We'll baptize you for the remission, for the washing away of your sins. We encourage you to come. Right now, shall we pray? Oh God, we thank you so much. 
We are so grateful for your word and its ability to speak to our hearts and our minds. We know, oh God, that many of us have made such a mess of things. But after we have owned, after we've responded, help us to understand that now it's time to get up, dust ourselves up, and to try to do all that we can to regain trust, rebuild trust, and to just work toward making what's happened a distant memory. Be with our brothers and sisters that are struggling with those who've made these errors. Be with our families. Be with people in our community who are struggling with the word that's been shared today. God, we love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Hallelujah.